Yeah, yeah, back again. Right, listen, before I start, okay, I just want to issue a little bit of an apology to everybody because I don't think any of us wants to relive the horrific few years that was the past few years. It's been a horrendous time for everybody. But on the other hand, this is weirdest episodes and the entirety really of the lockdown era was a pretty weird episode. The global lockdown was a very crazy time because so many things changed. Suddenly various things we just take for granted in our lives were absolutely gone. Going to work or school, social gatherings, consuming various forms of entertainment. That's all, yeah, don't do that for a while. And obviously all that felt incredibly weird, but for us wrestling fans, I guess the weirdest thing of all was that wrestling didn't go away. And although it was a step down, or certainly really different to the wrestling we were used to, I guess the, the lockdown era did bring about some positive things. For example, the first ever stadium stampede match in AEW, that was pretty successful, wasn't it? Uh, over on the WWE side of things, we had that weird but hilarious first episode of SmackDown with no crowd where Triple H was in a silly mood and just decided to bully Michael Cole. That was, that was really entertaining. But on the other hand, for every positive, there was like a million drawbacks, wasn't there? And I'm not just talking about in day-to-day -day life, obviously, that was really terrible, but in terms of wrestling, which somehow stuck around during lockdown, like Baron Samadhi in the movie Live and Let Die, just refusing to go away, refusing to be killed off, because uh, this is wrestling, it's the industry that we, oh God, we love it so much. <laughs> in wrestling, there were so many drawbacks as well. WrestleMania 36 was probably the biggest example of this real weirdness. The biggest, grandest spectacle in all of wrestling, uh, in history, going back decades, is now in the performance center in front of nobody and it's just it, we, it's weird. There were so many weird things about WrestleMania 36, weren't there? I mean, they're all fresh in the memory because it was WrestleMania. You've got, I mean, you've got it taking place in the eerily quiet, empty performance center. You've got Drew McIntyre having his big crowning moment ruined because no one was there to see it in the flesh. You had Roman Reigns pulling out of the event, and honestly, who could blame it? You had Edge and Orton walking around and grunting for what felt like hours and hours and hours. You had the tag team titles on the line in a triple threat match. And we had the legendary team, of course, of Angel Garza and Austin Theory. Right, guys? They've been friends forever, yeah? Don't think about it too much. But as I say, that was WrestleMania. Everyone remembers big things that happen at WrestleManias. So even though it was a few years ago now, we still kind of remember WrestleMania 36 pretty well. However, there was a show from a few months after this. An episode of wrestling's brightest star, Monday Night Raw, which I think really encapsulates, really sums up the follies, the foolishness, and the downright weirdness of the lockdown era. I'm Jack from Cultaholic, and this is Weirdest Episodes. Luke, if you'll please hit my little weird intro with the Yep. Yep. It's August 3rd in the cursed year of our Lord 2020 and WWE are about to broadcast one of the weirdest episodes of Raw ever seen. Just to set the scene, give a bit of context around this time, the general atmosphere of the wrestling business and specifically the fan attitude towards WWE, I think the initial burst of gratitude, like, oh, they're still entertaining us in this trying time, I think by August, that had kind of started to wear off a little bit. And while I think everybody was still feeling very grateful towards the talent, towards the wrestlers themselves, I don't think they were feeling too generous towards Vince McMahon or the WWE creative team, especially not after the horror show at Extreme Rules and the eye stipulation, and the swamp stipulation also. And I can't fault WWE for trying to experiment with different creative ideas that they perhaps couldn't do in front of a live audience. That was quite clever at the time, I suppose. They were experimenting with things like that Money in the Bank ladder match, which took place inside Titan Towers. That was a novel idea, which many people enjoyed and many people didn't, but at least they were trying something different. You also had the weirdly promoted best match ever between Edge and Randy Orton, which did suffer from being kind of edited in post. So even though it was a great match, it kind of challenged our very conception of what can be considered a good wrestling match. But while you had all these kind of weird experimentations and things which kind of challenged opinion and split opinion and caused nice debate, I suppose, then you had Extreme Rules, the horror show at Extreme Rules, which is where things really jumped the shark. Little did we know that as rubbish as that show was, on Raw, things were about to get a whole lot worse. Let's dig in. 
This August 3rd edition of Raw comes in between the horror show at Extreme Rules and SummerSlam. It's in the gap between those two pay-per-views. It also comes in the gap between the empty arena era and the Thunderdome era. It's kind of in between those where the audience was like performance center people, suspiciously enthusiastic, muscular fans who do exactly what is expected of them at all times. You can tell these are plants because they are all delighted to be here. Not a single one of these has ever complained about a wrestling show on Twitter. That's because they're probably too busy working out at the gym or being conventionally attractive or doing something actually worthwhile with their lives. And it's disgusting. Disgusting! And to my absolute delight, one of the first people to grace our screens as the intro is happening and we're panning around is that Von Wagner from NXT. My word it is. I know the mask kind of obscures who it might be. That is unmistakably Von Wagner, the heart and soul of the finest brand in all of WWE today. And I couldn't be happier. This episode's gotten off to a, a, a wicked start. I can't even talk. I'm so excited. We then see our commentary team. Who's the trio, you ask? Why, it's Tom Phillips, Byron Saxton, and Samoa Joe, which felt normal at the time, remember? But in hindsight, is absolutely insane. One's now at Impact, one's now wrestling CM Punk, renewing a, a decades-old feud, and one's, well, I mean, Byron's still being Byron Saxton. Samoa Joe is a particularly interesting case. Like, if this episode of Raw had a bit like the Faith Evans bit at the end of Coach Carter, where it's like, I'm hopeful, yes I am, hopeful for today, and then the, the subtitles come up like, this guy went to UCLA and sat on the bench for four years. This guy got a business degree. This guy did that. Samoa Joe's would be so weird. It'd be like, Joe remained commentator until the following April, where after wearing a poncho at WrestleMania, he was released from the company. Then was hired back a couple of months later, then became NXT champion once again, then was forced to relinquish the belt, then became a trainer, then got released again, and is now working for Tony Khan. Tom Phillips runs down the start of the show. He's like, here's what we can expect, guys. Wait one second. The lights just flickered and things went a bit weird. What could this possibly mean? Oh, just you wait, because we're going to find out eventually. Hold your horses. It's really good. It's, re it's really bad. It's really good. The first wrestler out from the back is Apollo Crews. Apollo! Just in case you didn't know who it was. Here he comes. He's, and then the lights flicker again. And this time, Tom Phillips sells it like Dolph Ziggler. He's like, what? Ha oh my goodness, what happened there? His explanation to the audience is, sorry folks, I, I think we have weather in the area. Weather in the area. There's always weather in every area. Oh, sorry, I thought we were on Jupiter for a second. In fact, isn't Jupiter infamous for having that bit of it that looks like an eye and there's a perpetual storm raging within Jupiter? Jupiter's a mystery, man. Of all the planets in the solar system, I'm probably maybe most scared of Jupiter because it's just so big, man. It's, it's incomprehensibly big. Let me know which planet you're most scared of in that comment section down below. One, two, you hear the clock ticking. One, two, here we go. I'm coming. Nobody can stop me. No, but that's right. MVP comes out as well. He's got a US title belt, but he's not US champion. Basically, at the last pay-per-view, Apollo couldn't defend his United States Championship because he'd been beaten down by Bobby Lashley. So then MVP declared himself champion, but he's not actually the champion. Apollo is still the champion, and they're having the actual match right now. MVP is out with the Her Business, which at this time consists of Bobby Lashley and reigning 24-7 champion Shelton Benjamin. Oh, dear. MVP cuts a promo on Apollo and says, once we're done battering you, mate. You can go and hang out with Cedric Alexander and Ricochet in catering. Now, I should point out that Cedric and Ricochet are feuding with the Hurt Business at the time, but out of context, it just feels like they've caught some absolute strays from MVP at, at random. The match goes how you'd expect with Apollo the more, the, well, the younger, the fresher, the more athletic of the two, but MVP is controlling things with the help of his heelish pals on the outside. And then the lights flicker again. It's that weather in the area. What's going on? MVP here sells it really well. He even does like a comedy like what's going on here kind of expression. And I also have to commend the roster here for being so committed to putting over this incoming force that we don't know what it is yet, but it, it's certainly threatening just by their reactions. It's been put over, in fact, way more than any babyface in the Roman Reigns era. Oh dear, oh dear. I'm not, I'm not over Cody losing it in the main event of Mania. That's, I'm, st I'm still on that high horse. The finish comes when Cruz takes a German suplex, but he fights back to his feet like he's in all Japan, hits his finisher, and wins the match. 
Behind the curtain we go immediately with Apollo Crews, where Charlie Caruso is on hand to interview him after defending his title successfully. Now, I feel bad for Apollo here because, you know, wrestlers can often, he's literally just had his match, he's very tired, adrenaline's still pumping, he's all over the place, and that can be a difficult state in which to cut a promo, a coherent promo on the mic. And some wrestlers are able to really channel this sort of nervous energy and this borderline exhaustion and running on fumes, and they can really channel some amazing emotion in moments like like these some wrestlers can't do it i'm not i'm not trying to i'm not trying i'm not trying to criticize apollo here i think he's done the best with what he can possibly do and a very difficult step <laughs> this is a really weird interview apollo does what english football fans will know as the frank lampard if you know what i'm talking you know if you know the frank lampard thing in interviews you know what apollo's done here for those who don't know what the frank lampard thing is where he'll crack a light-hearted joke straight away and then get instantly very serious so Apollo's got both the US belts now, and he goes like, he start, he's all lighthearted. He's like, oh yeah, baby, Charlie, I'm still the US champion, but Bobby Lashley's the strongest man I've ever felt. He wasn't even wrestling Lashley, by the way. He was wrestling MVP, as we know, but he's just talking about back when Lashley beat him down a few weeks ago. He then wraps things up by kind of talking about how he's going to hang one of the US title belts on his wall at home so his kids can look at it and be proud of what their dad's achieved. And I'm like, you know what? That's quite a cool way of, of writing in to a storyline like the retiring of a belt design. So he's going to keep the new design. He'll, he'll hang that one up at home and it, make, it all makes sense, feeds into his babyface character and everything. And it's an emotional part of the promo, but he's laughing throughout of it. <laughs> So he just comes across absolutely deranged. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang it on the wall. I'm okay, all my kids are gonna look at it. Like it's very clear to me that Vince has told him, you're a baby fish, you're a baby fish, damn it, laugh. So he's like, no matter what he's saying, he's like, oh, I wanna keep my job. Back we go to ringside where MVP is screaming at the announce table that he got screwed and he wants a rematch. Nice touch that Byron and Phillips look a bit scared of the hurt business and Joe could not care less. Now it's time for a backstage interview with the two-woman power trip. It's Sasha Banks and Bailey who have all the belts. They say, you know what, actually, we're so great that we're going to throw, we've made a little video package which talks about how great we are. And then we get, like, they throw to a professionally edited video package which even has, like, that guy doing the, in a world, like the voiceover, in a world. I can't, I cannot physically make my voice go low enough. But anyway, this is, this is a trope of wrestling that I've never understood, and it gets used quite a lot these days, where you've got a cocky heel wrestler who goes, I'm so sick, look at how great I am, I've even made a little video package to show how sick I am. And then you obviously get a very in-house produced, well in this case, WWE style video package. The only time in recent memory I can think that this trope was utilized successfully was when Jericho and the Inner Circle did it, but they were like doing a parody of the Nightmare Family style of the, the Cody Rhodes stuff, that was genius to be fair. But hold on now, because this isn't any normal hype package for Sasha Banks and Bailey. because right at the end of it, somehow Asuka has managed to like hijack the video and just like splice her own bit in at the end. Presumably she's also got Premiere Pro, so shout out to that. What does she do in the video package? She sits in a room and, and kind of rambles in Japanese because that's the level of character depth that they've given her. Back we go to the interview area. Sasha and Bailey are furious. They're like, what? How can they? How did she get access to our video? What the hell, man? And then Shayna Baszler comes along and she's like, Sasha Banks, I want a title shot off you right now. And Sasha's like, well, you're not getting one. Bang! Shayna decks Sasha. Now, then something really weird happens. Think in your brain now how a segment like this would usually go. Like someone's just come in, demanded a title shot deck the champion. This is going to lead to a brawl, right? Or a scuffle or a beat down or maybe just the champion's totally KO'd. Instead, we get something that is none of those things at all. Instead, Sasha gives like a really middle of the road response. Like instead of being knocked out or instead of being fine and fighting back, she kind of goes like, get out of here. <laughs> as if the, like, as if Shane has just done something mildly annoying rather than knocked her jaw into the next building. And then the segment just ends. And I'm left with that feeling that we often get sometimes as wrestling fans where you realize just how weird wrestling is. Like at its very core, when it's even being as normal as it can be, wrestling is still a deeply, deeply weird thing to watch, isn't it? Uh, we've all got to be honest with ourselves here. But then when it's awkward on top of that, then it just turns into like the room, basically. 
Oh, hi, Shayna. Uh, um, yeah, you can keep that in, Luke, but also keep this bit in so that it, it, so it comes across to the audience that I wasn't confident about this joke. Elsewhere, the Iconics are trying to convince Kevin Owens to let them be guests on the upcoming edition of the KO show. Uh, Kevin Owens is like, no, I've already got a guest. They're really offended. And obviously, there's, there's nothing to make fun of here. It's just three very charismatic performers breezing their way through a promo segment that would trip up like half of the roster probably. They've just got such an easy, natural humor and charisma about them, and it's honestly made everybody else on the show so far look like malfunctioning robots, apart from MVP and Samoa Joe. And so the KO show is right now, it's next. Kevin comes out, he says, right, like Shane and Max come back obviously, but even though he's a good guy now, I still hate him because Kevin Owens is that rare example of a wrestler who has sound logical reasoning and actual like memory. As Owens is on the mic, we get another technical glitch, like the mic cuts out for a bit. And rather than everyone else so far who's gone, what, what's that? A weather, it must be bloody Jupiter again. Owens is the only one who sells it like a normal human would. Like he just kind of goes, oh, oh, and then just breezes on with his promo, which sounds simple enough, but I think that's probably quite a difficult thing to convey. So, I mean, I'm not breaking any new ground here, but Kevin Owens is awesome at what he does. KO then brings out his guest, neither member of the Iconics because he rejected them. No, it's Destination. Oh, no. Ruby, 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 Ruby Riot. Not Soho. The gist of their conversation is Kevin Owens basically saying, it's been a while since you've won, isn't it? And Ruby's like, yeah, my, my recent win over Peyton Royce was actually my first victory since about six months before that. And Kevin Owens is polite, but should really go, yo, you're really bad. Ruby says, yeah, man, that, that made my victory last week really special. It was the first one in such a long time. The only thing that would have made it even better would have been if my old tag partner, Liv Morgan, had been there to celebrate with me. And Kevin Owens is like, well, here she is. And Liv comes out and it's really awkward. It's as awkward as like when you bump into your old girlfriend from when you were 17, not her, but her parents. You bump into her parents at the pub, even though you've not seen them for like years since you broke up. And then you're with your new girlfriend and she hasn't even met your parents yet, but she's meeting the parents of the girl you went out with when you were a teenager. And you're just like, oh, this is, not that that's happened, not that that's, hmm. Anyway, Liv gets on the mic as well. Her and Ruby dance around the idea of getting the Riot Squad back together. They are both weeping uncontrollably. There's loads of tears here. They're both doing really well. They're both performing it well. It's very dramatic, but I just feel like they've missed a step in the story. Like, I don't think they've got a deep enough history together to be so emotional. Like, if this was Owens and Zayn deciding to get back together, like we saw recently, then I would maybe understand why there would be so many tears. But in this case, I'm like, have I missed, have I missed something? But I possibly have to be fair. Anyway, out come the Iconics, bitter about not being on this segment, and they interrupt things, and commentary act like they've just crashed a funeral. Commentary are like, this is so disrespectful. They come out and they brag about being way better best friends than Liv and Ruby ever were. Kevin Owens is like, can we cut her mic? And Peyton Royce slaps him like Inoki. Owens is like, was that really necessary? Billy Kay slaps him as well. And then, you know, the faces attack the Iconics, and then the Iconics bail, and the faces stand tall. When I say the faces attack the Iconics, I mean just the two women, Ruby and Liv. Been a bit awkward if Owens had joined in as well and it was just a vicious three on two beat down. That didn't happen, don't worry. Backstage we go and who is this? Why it's Omos, but we don't know his name is Omos yet. Back then the reaction to him was just, have you seen this giant dude? Omos is the bouncer. He's standing watch over a door. A guy comes up with a tray of drinks, but Omos scares him away and doesn't let him inside. And there's music from inside. You can hear it behind the door. Yes, you, you've worked it out already. This is the episode of Raw where we are introduced to Raw Underground, baby. More on this later on, obviously, but for now, let's just say that it is crazy to me that, well, first of all, it's crazy that Shane McMahon first saw Fight Club in, into his late 40s, but also it's crazy to me that they saw Omos, WWE, right? They saw this giant dude and they were like, let's make him the unnamed doorman of a backstage segment who you barely see. Because obviously, Omos just totally overshadows the very concept of Raw Underground. I didn't see this backstage segment and think, ooh, what's the music going on behind that door? What's the club? What's the club back behind the door, guys? I saw this segment and thought, who is that legitimate seven-foot man standing next to this door? And I haven't seen him yet on this show about people fighting each other. What the hell's going on? Back to the ring, and the Iconics now have a match with Ruby and Liv, which 
I really don't have much to say about it. It really doesn't last very long. Uh, the baby faces win. Uh, they work together again, which kind of feeds into this whole idea of should they get the gang back together again and be a team again because they're working together to get the job done. Liv and Ruby can the... Jack, grow up, mate. Come on. Next up's my favorite segment of the, one of my favorite segments of the night, but like, this is one that I don't think anyone will remember. Like, we remember the big stuff that happened on this weird episode, but I, I had no clue this happened, right? Backstage we go, and Charlie Caruso is next to a box that's fallen over. Um, I've written down the start of this thing that she says, word for word, because you need to hear how insane and how badly written this bit of the show is. Uh, it's, it's scarcely believable. Keep in mind before I read this to you that this is professional wrestling that we're watching. It's the thing we're all fans of. It's the thing we all love. It's the most crazy, wild, unpredictable, unhinged, dramatic medium in the entire world. It's the most dramatic storytelling medium in the world. The writers can take this in any direction they want. And this, and this is what they came up with, right? Here's what Charlie says, here we go. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, there were some reports earlier this evening about a large noise stemming from this area, and they are now telling me that it's the result of these large boxes that fell over. You can see there's debris, there's pieces of the boxes all over the ground. Unfortunately, there was no one nearby, so no one was injured. However, there are rumors, and keep in mind, these are just rumors at this point, but there are show personnel and also some superstars who are telling me that these boxes falling over was no accident. And and it was actually deliberate and the cause of the power outages and audio issues that we've heard tonight. And then she gets interrupted by MVP. But there are so, I'll, don't worry, I'll go into this. There are so many things wrong with what she's just said. So many things. I'm Jack from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the top 10 things wrong with Charlie Caruso's promo right here. Join us. Number 10, the fact that she keeps saying that large boxes fell over, but they could only be bothered to set up one box for the shot. Like you only see that one box has fallen over, but she consistently refers to the like boxes. Look at these boxes. It's just one box, Charlie. Number nine, the phrase that she used stemming from this area. Like there have been some boxes that have fallen over stemming from this area as if they're unsure exactly where it happened, even though she's literally stood where the boxes fell over. That's not a groundbreaking one. I just found it annoying. Number eight, Charlie's report that there are pieces of the boxes all over the ground. Let's just take a closer look. I don't think there actually are pieces of boxes. As you can see, there's separate panels of blue painted wood that are next to the fallen box, but I refuse to count that as pieces of boxes. I think the actual culprit box is still fully intact in my opinion. It's just fallen open. There's no pieces of boxes. Number seven, the fact that the technical issues started at the very beginning of the show and are only being reported upon now, 38 minutes later. It took them 38 minutes to find the box that had fallen over. Number six, if the boxes were the cause of the show's technical issues, that means that they fell at least 38 minutes ago, made a huge noise that the show personnel and some superstars heard and reported to Charlie, and everyone just ignored it for half an hour. Number five, the fact that the boxes are probably causing the technical issues that have blighted the show so far, that's what Charlie's telling us, and despite that, nobody's picked up the box. If we look again, sorry again, Luke, enhance, please, one more time. The box is lying on a wire that I assume is critical for both the lights and the sound system. WWE have worked out that this is probably the cause of the technical issues we've been having, but they haven't done anything about it. Number four, the fact that, as mentioned, WWE haven't been bothered to send somebody to remove the fallen box and fix whatever technical issues are being caused by the fallen box, but they have sent an in-house reporter in Charlie Caruso to the scene. Their priorities are way out of line. Number three, the fact that Charlie's still standing in the danger zone. She, if you look, she's directly underneath a box that could fall as well. What are you doing? I slapped myself there in the leg and it actually hurt a bit. How do these bloody young bucks do it? Number two, the part where Charlie reassures us that there are rumors that this was no accident, but don't worry, these are just rumors. I have an issue here with her choice of the word rumors. I'll explain. Presumably nobody was there when the box fell over because as we mentioned, nobody's bothered to pick it up yet and it's taken them over half an hour to discover the fallen boxes that's been causing the technical issues on the show. So why are these rumors then that, that this was caused by someone? No one's seen anything or have they? Have some people backstage seen shady figures moving to and from the scene around this sort of time when it happened. And if so, I wouldn't call those rumors. I'd probably call them theories. A theory that, spoiler alert, we'll find out is correct later on in the show, let me tell you. 
And number one, my biggest issue with it is that, you know, I think we all know what this is leading to, presumably, if you've seen WWE TV around this sort of time. Um, it's a it's an unsuccessful storyline. In fact, it kicks off what I would call a disastrous storyline, a real failure, a flop of a storyline. A tricky storyline to nail as well, one which one which they shouldn't have ever attempted to do, and one which really needed to get off on the best foot possible. It needed to start off strong, and it didn't, because with this little segment here, it's kind of been doomed from the beginning. It just feels slapdash, thrown together, and things would only get worse from here on out. That was my little list there. Thank you so much, everybody. Anyway, uh, what happens next, bloody Oliver? Oh yeah, MVP complains about losing to Apollo Crews until Shelton comes along and says, MVP, someone's stolen my 24-7 belt, man. And MVP's like, well, we better go and find it then, bunny lad. And they turn into old Geordie men, apparently. They run off to find Shelton's title belt. We head back to the ring and Drew McIntyre's out there cutting a promo. On Randy Orton. Drew is the WWE champion at the time, it's worth mentioning, and the theme of his promo is the similarities or the perceived similarities between himself and the Viper. He says, at one time or another, we were both told by Vince McMahon that we were the chosen ones. There's only one chosen one in my world, and that's Jeff Jarrett. The chosen one. <laughs> Drew raises a very interesting point. He says, I dreamed, I fought it, I clawed to make it in WWE, but Randy Orton didn't. It was just handed to him. He was born into this. And then we get quite an interesting change of topic from Drew, who says, uh, he brings up the time he was released in 2014 and says, yeah, I, I was young then, I was naive. I made mistakes. I did probably deserve to be fired, but look at what Randy Orton's done. And look at all the crap that people have had to clean up that he's done. It literally says, he says, literal crap that you've caused in the past that's had to be cleaned up and you should have been fired so many more times over than I ever was. And basically Drew's saying like, how have you still managed to stick around when I got sacked? And I think that's a damn good promo. Orton interrupts with his very short term manager at the time, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Orton is fired up. Like he's in this era of his career when he was a really motivated heel promo. Ric Flair's kind of got a sleepy smile on his face. He's just happy to be there. It doesn't mesh <laughs> at all. Orton and Drew go back and forth arguing. Orton goes, you know what? Yeah, I was handed everything and I was given so many second chances and that's because I'm the best and I deserve it. And Drew's like, I'm gonna right all the wrongs you caused when I beat you and retain my title. And Orton's like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll see about that then, won't we, Drew? And it's good, like it's good stuff. They're both great promos, but I'll be honest with you. It just has so much of it taken away with the lack of a full crowd there basically to respond to it and again it really hammers home that I just feel bad for Drew McIntyre that his big title reign his big moment that we'd all waited for for so long was ruined by by the pandemic that segment ends but we flow seamlessly down the stream like in deliverance to uh, the next segment backstage because Rick comes back through the curtain and he's talking to Kevin Owens and I know that Flair's not like a spring chicken I know that he's getting on a bit but uh, and it sounds harsh I just can't understand a lot of what he's saying here like he's mumbling he's not really unclenching his teeth when he's talking so he's kind of just talking with his mouth his teeth clenched for a while it's not the best the point of what rick's saying i think is that you know kevin owens you're great but you need to start being more mean more selfish you need to start taking care of yourself and not caring about anyone who gets in your way be more ruthless and kevin says back to him yeah well i mean that sounds good but that would make me like your boy randy and I don't want to be like that. And this sets up a match like for the next week, I think, between Owens and, and Orton. But my main thought watching this was, man, Ric Flair did not have to be here. Remember, this was during the height of the pandemic. Ric Flair, as an older guy, is definitely way more at risk. And I remember so clearly at the time, it just felt like they had Flair there because they could. And it seemed like such an unnecessary risk to take. He's not crucial to this storyline at all. He doesn't need to be there. He doesn't need to be a mouthpiece for Randy Orton. Randy Orton's a great promo around this time. So I, I genuinely don't know why they did this other than to be like, we're WWE, I'm Vince McMahon, I can do what I want. And I think that's really bad. Back to the ring we go and it's, <laughs> It's the dynamic duo. We've, they've had so many great feuds together. It's Nia Jax and road agent Pat Buck. Okay. She beat him up last week, you see. And she's here now to apologize. So 
We'll see where this goes. I think we can all tell where it's going to go. What happens is they kiss. No, I'm just kidding. Naya obviously is a heel. She doesn't show any sympathy whatsoever, any remorse for what she's done. In fact, she cuts a scathing promo on Pat Buck, calling him a skinny, scrawny loser who couldn't cut the mustard in his own career. So now he has to be a road agent and try and ruin my career. And I'm like, bloody hell, that's harsh. And also, is Pat Buck scrawny? Because I'm not like, uh, if he's scrawny, I, I don't exist. I'm just about like seven atoms, just a loose collection of atoms in a in a vaguely human form. Now, I wouldn't usually make such a big deal about that because like a heel calling someone scrawny, fair enough, but Naya, it's not just a throwaway line. She really hammers it home. She's like, come on, for, for such a little guy, you've got to have some fire about you. Come on, stand up to me, damn it, you little guy. And I, I can just, I can hear Vince writing this script for her as she's delivering it. Pat suspends Naya, so she sticks the headbutt in. Whoa. There we go. Shouldn't be such a small little scrawny little loser, Pat Buck, should you? I don't know. Next up, our truth runs out from the back, pursued by ninjas. Yes, it was him. It was our truth who stole Shelton's 24-7 belt, and now he's out here for a triple threat match. It's him, Shelton, and Akira Tozawa, who of course now has this gang of ninjas around him. This was a bad time in all of our lives. It's Tozawa who wins the match, quite a short match as well. He pins our truth while Sheldon and MVP are distracted, brawling with the ninjas. Really, really rubbish creative, really disappointing stuff, very pointless, very stupid. Also, best match of the night so far. Oh, here we go. Business is about to pick up because we're taking a trip to Raw Underground. Wait, no, we're not. <laughs> right, so what happens is Shane McMahon's here and he's watching some legit MMA action, the sort of things you wouldn't see in a pro wrestling match for losers. This has got stuff in it like clinching, ground and pound, like submissions and that. Similar to things you'd see in wrestling, but like less coherent from a narrative point of view because it's real. But this isn't, this isn't real, but it's, it's pretending to be something that's real, which is kind of what wrestling is as well, but then it became this ultra highly stylized version of itself. It, hmm, what's the point of Raw Underground? <laughs> anyway, Shane's there and goes, hi, I'm Shane O'Mark and w welcome to Jackass. <laughs> I was gonna do Johnny Knoxville's intro there. But no, he goes, hi, I'm Shane O'Mark and you're about to see Raw Underground. Tune in at the start of the third hour of tonight's episode of Raw. And I'm like, what, we have to wait until then? Well, what was the point of, oh man. I also love how Shane's dressed. Like I like the idea of him before getting to the arena or well, the performance center for the show. He's looking in his wardrobe and he's like, what can I wear that screams like gritty underground, like raw underground fight club kind of vibes. And instead he's kind of gone for tactical training exercise in the desert. Now we get a backstage interview with Dominic Mysterio. Obviously the change from him then to him now in just a few short years is staggering. Rhea Ripley really made a man out of him. Oh, oh, ooh, uh. And this reminds me of the Luke Skywalker theory, which I've read somewhere online, but does anyone else know about this? The idea that <laughs> at some point between the first Star Wars and then Return of the Jedi, so Luke, if you can put up, not, I'm not talking to Luke Skywalker, I'm talking to Luke the editor, but Luke, if you can put up the two pictures of Luke Skywalker, the first one when he's like, nerdy guy in the first one, like, oh, the power converter, isn't it? Like, yeah. And then the second one, when he turns up to save Han Solo on Jabba's flying barge, those two side by side. The theory is that in between nerdy first film Luke and then cool start of Return of the Jedi Luke, he lost his virginity at some point. That's essentially, that's what it is. Yeah, man, he, he got laid, didn't he? <laughs> anyway, that's what's happened to Dom. Dom's interview, right? The interviewer is really disrespectful. <laughs> the question's basically, Dom, you're not really tough in the slightest, are you? So why on earth are you trying to call out Seth Rollins? And Dom's like, well, because he took my dad's eye out at the last pay-per-view. Were you not watching? And I'm like, yeah, that's a very fair point, actually, Dom. Next up, Shayna Baszler versus Sasha Banks after the, the punch heard around the world a, a little bit earlier on. Um, this segment really annoyed me, not because of the action itself, because obviously Shayna and Sasha are both excellent, and it was really good in terms of just the sheer action. Shayna's really good at beating people up. Sasha's really, really good at being beaten up. So just, I mean, there's not been much actual wrestling on this show so far. Let these two excellent wrestlers have an excellent little wrestling match. Let it go a bit longer than usual and just, you know, let us see what's going on. And, and instead, Asuka runs out after not very long at all, attacks Bailey on the outside of the ring and they ring the bell and call the match off. That's not even a DQ. I'm, I'm fuming, man. I'm all right about it now in 2023, but back then I was probably 
sat in my bedroom on my own watching Raw, going, oh, I just want to, you want some good wrestling, man? It was a fragile time for us all. Back we get from a commercial break. Asuka's now in the ring being interviewed by Charlie Caruso. She's not even been reprimanded for ruining the previous match, which I was genuinely looking forward to. She's just been invited into the ring for an interview by Charlie Caruso, who is, I think, at this point, sneakily becoming this episode's main character. Asuka is annoyed because her tag partner, Kairi Sane, has been beaten down by Bailey and Sasha the other week. And now Asuka wants revenge and a title match against Sasha at the next pay-per-view. Shayna Baszler gets in the ring and says, Asuka, if you get that title shot at SummerSlam, I'll be watching and I'll be cheering you on because I want you to win that belt so I can come along and dismember you and take it from you. And I'm like, whoa, go on, Shayna, go on, Asuka. Have a, have a great match together, please. Then they're interrupted by the entrance of Sasha and Bailey, who were just at ringside two minutes ago. Like, they were having... Sasha was in the match, and Bailey was there at ringside, and then they went to the back, and then their music hit, and then they came out again. Who's in charge? Who's, who's in charge here, literally? This seems like one of those, you know, those reports that come out, like, Raw was hastily rewritten this week. The script was torn up at the 11th hour. It's, it really feels like one of those segments where it was hastily rewritten as the show was going on, because it makes no sense. Why did they leave? Why did they come back in? You know what I mean. Anyway, Sasha says, look, if you want a title shot, Asuka, against me, you're going to have to beat Bailey next week. Bailey doesn't look too happy about this. Sowing the seeds of dissent between the two women. Sow the seeds, sow the seeds. It's all, you know, that's fair enough. But the way we got there was so stupid. Backstage, we've got Angel Garza, who, as far as I can tell, is one of the most naturally charismatic and seamlessly gifted in the ring. People that WWE have got on their entire roster right now, why don't they use him at a way higher level than he is currently being used? And way more regularly as well. He's only just started appearing again on, on TV regularly after being in the wilderness for years. I love Angel Garza, right? Anyway, he's on this show, don't get your hopes up. He's just chatting up a woman called Demi, who's from The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. How did she get backstage in the middle of a pan ED? Did she hitch a ride on the back of Ric Flair? That sounds dodgy. It is Ric Flair. Andrade and Zelina interrupt and Zelina's like, you're from the reality shows. You don't belong here in this, in this business. Respect, remember everybody, rule number one of wrestling is respect the business. Don't make fun of it. Oh dear. Finally, yes, praise Jesus. It's time for Raw Underground. I just spat over there. I don't care no one else is in this room. Yes, a lot of you are going to watch this, but at the moment I don't feel embarrassed because I don't have any concept of you watching this right now. I'm literally in an empty room right now, so it's hard to feel self-conscious. But Right, anyway, Raw, Raw Underground, I'm a bit excited. It's worth noting that Shane's just still watching fights that we haven't been allowed to watch, but have been, it's implied they've been going on for the duration of the show while we've been watching crappy, crappy boxes falling over, run-ins that make no sense. What, what kind of marketing strategy is this? Make you think something cool's going on, but you're not allowed to see it. Yeah, maybe, maybe that is what they're doing, to be fair. That's it. I've just described the, I've just described pay-per-views as a concept, haven't I? Shane isn't paying attention to us as we enter the room, but then he notices the camera and starts talking to us like Malcolm in the middle. But then, because this is Shane and he's the coolest... He's the coolest dude and he's got nice trainers. He gets distracted by some lovely ladies. At exactly this moment, this is when I realised, oh, this entire Raw Underground idea is just Shane's self-insert fantasy, like, fan fiction of himself, isn't it? Like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the cool overseer of a fight club, and all these really tough guys do what I say, but they're also fighting each other, but also there's some dancing women, and they're all, and they're all interested in me, because I'm Shane McMahon, and I'm like, hey there, ladies, and I've got a drink, and I'm just like, Shane... Get in the bin, mate. It also comes across way more, I think, I think Shane wants it to be like gritty and real, but it comes across way more cartoonish. I'm expecting Johnny Bravo to turn up and fight Cow and Chicken. Cow and Chicken, man. That was a, that was a real cartoon. None of this, ooh, I'm, you know, Ben 10, I've got a wristband that, I was slightly too old to watch Ben 10, but I've got a brother who's a little bit younger, he watched Ben 10, I didn't. Ooh, I can turn into a monster by pressing my wristband, ooh. Shut up. I was raised on simple cartoons. No technology, no weird, ooh, turning into different aliens, depending on what. Simple cartoons, simple structures, Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Three lads, all called Ed, all absolute weirdos, mate. So simple. It's like a Gunter match. Bang. You want it even more simple? Cow and chicken. One's a chicken, one's a cow. Bang. Next show, please. You want it even simpler than that? <laughs> cat dog. It's just <laughs> the cat and a dog at the same time. Golden, golden days. 
Sorry, I got really wistful there. Back to Raw Underground, where Dabakado is battering someone that Shane doesn't even bother to introduce. And Dabba gets on top, and he's using some MMA ground and pound, but we don't really see what's going on, because the camera <laughs> camera cuts are going mad, like a million times. Shane's there going, stop, stop, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. All right, all right, we're good, we're good, we're good. And... That's, I've just summed up or like what 90% of the Raw Underground fights are like. Then a second guy gets in, Dabakato does the same to him, and Shane's like, whoa, 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 big guy, big guy, big guy, that's enough, big guy, whoa, 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 stop the fight, stop the fight, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it's an assault on the senses in a way. Back to commentary, and uh, the commentary team go, hey, whoa, that's pretty, um, that's pretty interesting. I think Shane O'Mac's really onto something here. This could be a game changer. And I'm like, no, it's not. Don't be, don't be too kind to Raw Underground. It's rubbish, isn't it? It's done way better in promotions like GCW's Bloodsport shows in America, WXW's Ambition Tournament in Germany, and also like 10 different Japanese promotions do this style better as well. Um, given the recent merger with the UFC, I wonder if any of them have seen Raw Underground. I assume not. And if they saw it, I wonder just what just what their reaction would be. Like, do you think Israel Adesanya watches Raw Underground and goes like, it's pretty sick actually, you know? Might try a bit of that in my next MMA fight. Oh, I'm trying to sound like I know what I'm talking about. And the, the sad thing is that I, I do watch a bit of MMA, but I'm no expert. I'm not cool enough. Now it's time for a promo with the Raw Tag Team Champions, the Street Profits. Dawkins wants to get with that girl from The Bachelor, and Montez Ford's like, whoa, Daw calm down, Dawkins, you big player. <laughs> The Street Profits then cut a promo on Gaza and uh, Andrade, and they're saying, look, we're way better best friends than you two guys are. Zia Vega just stuck those two together. We're real best friends. This is the second promo in the show, which is based entirely around the idea of being better best friends than your opponents are. The Iconics tried it with Liv and Ruby earlier on. They are interrupted by the targets of their ridicule, Gaza and Andrade, who come out, and instead of a tag match, we're actually going to get two back-to-back -back singles matches. Fair enough. First, Dawkins takes on Gaza and it's going pretty well. I'm enjoying it quite a bit. And then on the outside, Montez Ford collapses. Dawkins is obviously distracted by this and Gaza, he takes advantage of it and gets the win. Instead of the show then being stopped to check on a man who just collapsed on the outside, he wrestles his match anyway, <laughs> which is, you know, foolish. The match goes on a bit, but Ford's still very much selling whatever's happened to him. Like he's grabbing his stomach. He's like hunched over. He's woozy as well. He doesn't know what's going on. Even at one point, even Andrade stops and he's like, what's going on? The ref gets in the way and he's like, right, match is over. Get me a doctor. Get me a doctor. And that's just it. That's just how it ends. What's going on with Montez Ford? Has he been poisoned? I guess we'll find out. That was really silly, by the way. It was ridiculous. We'll find out what happened later on. Backstage, uh, what's next? Oh my God, I've distracted myself there. Oh, it's time for, remember the pairing of Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy, when Murphy was like his disciple? It's time for those guys. Buddy's angry. He's like really angry that Dominic's challenging Rollins at SummerSlam. He thinks it's ridiculous, but Seth's not as worried. Seth's like, hehehehe. <laughs> What's he planning? Back to Raw Underground now. Oh God. Um, now the you know the dancing ladies. There, two of them are about to fight. But Shane gets in there and calms it down because like not only is he really cool, but also like women just respect him. You know, he's just he's just sick. I'm literally a fly. Yeah, literally as I'm as I'm talking about Shane being suave and cool. The opposite is happening to me right now. Anyway, it's time for a Raw Underground fight. Uh, Shane introduces, so he says that Eric from the Viking Raiders is taking on a real tough kid. We don't know his name. Eric destroys him so much, it's not even funny. It's like the other guy's controller isn't even plugged in. Shane at this point commentates by going, this is sick, this is sick, this is sick. These shots are stiff, they're so stiff. These are stiff shots. Eric wins and I just, it goes without saying, but just to point it out here, by the way, there's no continuity between what's going on in Raw Underground and what's going on in in the real Raw universe. Because, like, Dabakato is destroying it, but he doesn't get a push on Raw. Um, at this moment, Eric is all serious and cool and tough, but this is the last thing he was doing in a feud with the Viking Raiders with, you know, against the Street Profits, that stupid comedy stuff that was going on, remember? I think Luke's just put up a few, hopefully a picture or two there. It was really stupid, really stupid. But because this is Raw Underground, we go back to commentary with Tom Phillips, who goes once again, this, man, this is awesome. Shane's had a really good idea here. And I'm like, st you st stop it, Tom Phillips. Back we go to the main character, Charlie Caruso, who's waiting outside the medical room to try and check up on Montez Ford's condition. Angel Garza comes along, starts flirting with her, and Charlie's a rubbish journalist. Cause she, well, 
Obviously, in real life, all that stuff's went down. But in, in, in character, she's also a rubbish journalist. <laughs> because because she, she just gets distracted by Angel and how handsome he is. And he, she's just buzzing that he's flirting with her. Look at her. She's so smitten. This is where things get really obvious. Because, you know, before I was like, has Ford been poisoned? Like, obviously, yes, he's been poisoned. But to really hammer this home, Andrade and Zelina come along. And they're, they're like, oh, no, is Ford OK? I guess he'll have to relinquish the tag team titles at SummerSlam then. I guess that's what's gonna have to happen. And and then we learn officially that Ford indeed has been poisoned. And the heels go like, what, what? Have you seen the meme of the guy who learns that the place that everyone gets like their burgers from has been selling drugs? I wish that fly would go away. And he goes like, what? You know the guy that, that I never knew that, what? It's like that, that's, this is exactly what happens here. What? Nah, I never knew that, I never knew that. Bianca, obviously Ford's partner in real life, emerges from the room and tries to fight with Zelina for poisoning her man, and they get held apart. Tom Phillips, now here's where things get stupid. They've been stupid already. This is where things get really stupid. Tom Phillips goes, hang on, we've just obtained some CCTV footage from outside earlier today, and we see a group of masked hoodlums throwing Molotov cocktails at a power generator. And you thought a box falling over. Let's just, they thought a box falling over cause the power issues. Not the flaming bottles being thrown at the power generator. Charlie told us that was a box. In a corridor, main character Charlie Caruso stops the her business and goes, lads, you're having a rubbish night, aren't you? That's basically what she says. You're having a really bad episode of Monday Night Raw. Shelton, you lost the 24-7 title. MVP, you lost a match to Apollo Crews. And Bobby Lashley, the way things are going, it's probably a good thing that you're not wrestling tonight, eh? I'm like, Charlie, what the? She's dropping, she's dropping savage bars on these fools. Obviously, they don't take too kindly to this very scathing criticism. In fact, MVP says, Charlie, what the hell are you doing? You've got people outside throwing Molotov cocktails at the generator, and you're asking me stupid questions like that. And I'm like, you know what? That's actually a very fair point. Bobby wants to blow off some steam, and he goes, right, let's find where that raw underground is taking place. And he heads off. God, I hope he doesn't get into any fights at the underground fight club. That would be disastrous. After a long video package recapping all the drama recently between Seth Rollins and Rey Mysterio, and then Seth Rollins and Dominic Mysterio, we finally get the arrival into the arena of Seth Rollins. Seth is accompanied by Murphy and also gets on the mic and calls out, of all people, Tom Phillips. He asks if Tom considers himself to be a professional. And at this point, one of the guys in the crowd I don't think this was planned, but it's really funny anyway. Like, it's genuinely my favorite part of the show, probably. Just gets really defensive on behalf of Tom Phillips, going like, what's your problem with Tom? Like, you hear him from off camera going, that guy's a broadcast journalist, Seth. Seth accuses Tom of cheering Dom the other week when Dom was beating up Seth with a kendo stick, and he goes right up to the table and gets in Tom's face. Tom does a great job of looking scared. Smojo just hilariously just looks bored. He's like, yeah, I beat this guy in Ring of Honor in 2008. I'm not intimidated. Seth tells Phillips that he's being replaced on commentary. And then he goes, Murphy, take him. Murphy comes over, Joe gets up to defend his broadcast partner. And I'm like, oh yes. And Joe's like, if you want to take my buddy Tom, you've got to go through me. I'm like, oh, try something. Samoa Joe's awesome. This leads to a bit of a standoff and the two heels grab chairs to keep Joe at bay. Uh, and there's not really anything going on there. But then from behind, here comes Dom. The, the, the opening's there for him. And he attacks Seth with a kendo stick. And the heels have to bail. And Dom's fired up. I should mention, actually, during that little scramble while the heels were running away, Seth gets control of the kendo stick, goes to hit Dom, but accidentally hits Murphy instead. And it's such a funny... I mean, I wouldn't like to take that shot, but they do a great job. It's such a funny cell and connection and he just cracks his own friend with a kendo stick it's hilarious sometimes wrestling at its most slapstick is when it's at its best seth accepts dom's challenge for SummerSlam, and that and by the way that acts i believe as dom's wwe debut back to the announce table we go uh tom phillips is still very shaken up by what's just happened so joe gives him just a little little cool guy fist bump and tom sadly accepts the fist bump he's still like scared but he's like thank you joe we all deserve a Samoa Joe in our lives, around these mean streets. Our main event is up next, and our main event of the night is... Raw Underground. <laughs> Raw Underground is the main event. Shane is commentating in his Shane way. This is sick. This is ground a pound, ground a pound. He's commentating over a Dolph Ziggler match. Uh, Dolph is busy tapping out some fool. Then the Her Business come along, and MVP says, Right, Raw Underground is now under management of the Hurt Business. He then goes, right, who wants to face Bobby Lashley? And do you know who I think it is? I think, please clarify if I'm wrong, but I think that's, 
I think the guy who faces Bobby is Cool Hand Ange from the Jericho Appreciation Society and from beloved indie tag team 2.0 before that as well. But it's Cool Hand Ange. He gets very quickly knocked out by Lashley. Then MVP beats up some guy that I didn't recognize. And then Shelton beats up, I think that was Dio Madden. And the Hurt Business are just running wild. Then they start beating up the crowd and like they clear the room. Like they clear the room of Raw Underground and eventually it's only Shane left. And he, but he's cool Shane, so he's not intimidated by them. He's just kind of cool. He's in on the joke. He's in with the guys, the her business. So he goes like, hey, whoa, 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 calm down. This is sick. This is sick. He goes, hey, I like you guys. And as long as, you know, as long as Raw Underground exists, you guys can keep coming. You can keep hanging around here. I'm like, get lost, man, Shane. But that's what happens. And then <laughs> they're all posing in the ring. And Shane's in front of them on the floor, like Bugs Bunny going like, that's all, folks. Like, Get in the sea, mate. So that's the end of this segment of Raw Underground, and it's also the end of this episode of Raw, which wasn't just the first time we see Raw Underground, but also, as you might have suspected, the first time we'd see Retribution. That's right. Let's give a summary of where all these threads would end up um, after being presented. Oh, and by the way, if you want, stick on in a separate tab, stick on Faith Evans. I'm hopeful, yes I am, hopeful for today. After being presented as the toughest man in all of WWE and Raw Underground as well, Lashley would go on to um, watch his manager MVP lose a title shot to Apollo Crews on the SummerSlam pre-show. Elsewhere on the show, Asuka got a shot at both of the women's titles, losing to Bailey, but later taking Sasha's belt off her and ramping up tension between Bailey and Sasha. Elsewhere, the Street Profits got revenge for the poison angle, beating Andrade and Garza to retain the tag belts. Uh, Seth Rollins beat Dom in Dom's in-ring debut, where Dom held himself in good stead. I think he did all right. And Drew McIntyre retained his title against Randy Orton, but it was with a roll-up because he's a good wrestler, you see. Elsewhere on the SummerSlam show, uh, we didn't see them on this episode of Raw, but Mandy Rose beat Sonya Deville in a loser leaves WWE match. Really ironic given how things have turned out and which one has actually left WWE. And in the main event, The Fiend beat Braun Strowman to win the Universal title. But more importantly, they were both attacked at the end by a returning Roman Reigns. This would lead, of course, to Roman winning the belt, becoming champion, a title he still holds now at the time of recording, and presumably forever. If you're watching this from a future in which Roman doesn't hold a belt anymore, let us know what's going on in the comments down below. Do we have flying cars yet? Thanks very much for watching. I've been Jack from Cultaholic Wrestling. That was a weird episode. Thank you very much to Luke on the edit as well, and thank you all once again for watching. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon, guys. <laughs> weird there at the end, mate. Oh well, take care.